Dearborn, Michigan, USA. An industrial city built on the backs of generations of immigrants. And now it boasts the largest concentration of Arab Americans anywhere. And tonight, it's home to this. Yes, yes, yes. We are here to do the biggest Arab comedy show ever in America, and it could only happen in our capital, Dearborn, Michigan. This is where it is. That's right. Dearborn, the Arab Disneyland. Only place in the world you can have a falafel, a hookah, and a protest all in the same day. You don't gotta go anywhere. You don't gotta get out of your car. I love it, man. There are a lot of Arabs, if you're Arab tonight, make some noise. Arabs tonight, make some noise. That's right. Now, Arabs, we are a lot of Arab, but we come from many different branches, okay? Iraqis, any Iraqis here tonight, make some noise. Yes, Iraqis are my favorite people. They are either walking around in a full white gown with sandals, <laughs> or five foot high spiked hair, or sometimes both. Okay, they got my favorite dance in the world. It's the chubby, 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 chubby. He gets all in the shoulders. I think that's where shoulder lean came from. The Harlem Shake. <laughs> my favorite people. And then we have the original Arabs, Yemenis. Any Yemenis here tonight? That's right, Dearborn has the biggest Yemeni population. The curfew Arabs. Don't worry, we'll get done soon so you can all make it home. <laughs> Curfew Arabs. <laughs> the six name Arabs. Have you met them before? Abdul Salam, Abdul Hakim, Al Mutasim, Al Mutasim, Al Harith, Al Mansur, Al Yemeni. You're like, damn. Very proud of their culture. Favorite people. Favorite people. They have, they have their dance. I don't know what it's called, but it's all in your feet. It's just, it's, the, it's like the, cha, the Arab cha cha slide. <laughs> One hop this time. And then, of course, Dearborn is home to the largest Lebanese community in the United States. That's right. The Lebanese community who came here and built Dearborn, what we see today. Dearborn was a ghost town before Arab Americans came to rebuild Dearborn. This is who we are. We rebuild stuff. With anything is possible in Dearborn. Anything is possible. Aswa al Mustafa can become super green landmark. At Anything is possible. Aswa al-Rida. Papaya. That is the actual Google translation. <laughs> Anything is possible here in Dearborn. Lebanese Arabs, my favorite. Lebanese Arabs are the ones who sometimes give their kids white names. Their girls get white names. And then the boys get like blacklist names, okay? <laughs> you can have a guy, three daughters and a son. What's your, what's your kids' names? Eliana, Juliana, Milana, and Jafar Ali Labbas. I'm like, all right, damn. So he's not gonna get on the plane. All right. And then, of course, we have all other kinds of Arabs here in Michigan. We have the largest Arab American community anywhere. We got everyone, we got Egyptians. We got, we got, we got uh, uh, people from North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, all these beautiful places. We got, we got people from Sudan here in Dearborn. We got, we got all kinds of people. Anybody here from Saudi Arabia? Okay, so they own the theater. So they're, they're, they're here. And then, of course, 
We have my people, the Palestinian people. Yes. Yes. The Palestinian people, we don't have a dance or a song. We just protest. It is different for us. I knew when I was different, I was growing up, my best friend who lived across the street, a little white kid named Tommy, we hung out with each other all the time. But I knew that I was different. One year, Tommy's mom took me and Tommy to the mall to go see Santa Claus. And we waited in line for an hour. And finally, it was our turn. And Tommy went first, and Santa said, what do you want for Christmas, little boy? And Tommy said, let me have a bike. And Santa said, no problem. Then it was my turn. And that's when I knew I was, I was different. Because I sat on Santa Claus's lap, and Santa said, what do you want for Christmas, little boy? And I looked at him with my little Palestinian eyes. And I said, um, enforcement of UN Resolution 194, <laughs> allowing us to return. No, we, we just have different dreams. That's right, we Palestinians, we march, we chant, and we don't care if it rhymes or it doesn't rhyme. We just say it. One, two, three, four, no occupation, no war. Five, six, seven, eight, free, free Palestine. We don't give a shit. Doesn't matter where we go, we start it just, what? it'll work anywhere, anywhere in Dearborn, watch, it'll work. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. I'd like to welcome the white people to the show as well. <laughs> Any white people here with us tonight? Just regular, boring, just regular, just regular, boring white people. I'd like to invite them. Since we're here in Dearborn and in a high school of 2,400 students, bigger than many universities, 96% of which are Arab American, that means I would also like to welcome all of our uninvited guests from the FBI and the CIA who are here with us tonight. Let's have a big hand for them. They're here. Thank you. Some of them look like us. <laughs> That's right. Dearborn, Michigan, where anything is possible. Where we just elected our first Arab American mayor right here in Dearborn, Michigan. That's right. Dearborn, Michigan, the first Arab American mayor. 35 years ago, somebody ran for mayor in this town and said, let's talk about the Arab problem. Now the Arab problem is we rebuild neighborhoods. We rebuild economic districts. See, this city runs on the engine of Arab Americans. That's, that's the way Dearborn is now. But now we have a new Arab mayor. There's going to be some changes. Not all of them have been publicized. Right now, I think the city council meetings start at 7.30 on Tuesdays. From now on, they're going to start at 7.30, 7.45, 8 o'clock, maybe Wednesday. <laughs> Ramadan will now be two months in the city of Dearborn. <laughs> That's right. And they are changing the Ford Community Performing Arts Center to the Biblos Banquets Performing Arts Center. That's what it's going to be named from now on. Dearborn, Michigan. See, I moved here on purpose. See, I didn't, I didn't grow up here. My parents brought me here when I was a teenager. We went to the Arab Festival on Warren Avenue. My parents brought me here when I was, and I was like, oh, this, this is amazing. I gotta live here. And then I did. And now I do. And it is amazing. Anything is possible. You can work hard in Dearborn, make a lot of money, and one day you will have your own white Range Rover with red leather with a dealer plate. That'll be yours here in Dearborn. Because <laughs> we hustle. We hustle. But as you know, the city of Dearborn is about 110,000 people. And according to the federal government, it is 89% white. So that's what happens on these census forms. They, they, they have all these boxes. The American government knows exactly how many other kinds of people there are in Dearborn. They know exactly how many black people there are in Dearborn. They know exactly how many Latino people are in Dearborn. 
They know exactly how many Samoan people there are in Dearborn. They count all that shit. But they don't count us. They call us white. But, but we're not white. We're not white. We deserve our own boxes. Everybody here in Dearborn agree? We deserve our own box. Yes. I want every white person, all the white people, anywhere. where's the white guys? Any white guys here? Yeah? 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 What's your name, sir? Yeah, you. Dan. See, this is a good white name, Dan. Dan, Dan. It's like the Mahmoud of white names, Dan. Dan. See, Dan, look around this room. Do you, you see a lot of white people? I don't see a lot of white people. I just see, okay, don't interrupt me. I just only see one. Dan, I hate doing shows in front of Arabs, all right? It's the worst fucking job in the world. Because they try to participate. Do you see Dan? He's just sitting there nice, quiet, like a good white person watching the show. I got other Arabs over here. Okay, I got you, bro. See, Dan, according to the federal government, there's a room full of white people. But we know that we're not. We're not white. We do things different than white people. I wish we were white. It seems amazing. <laughs> seems like the best thing to be. But we're not. We are not white. We are not white. We do everything different, especially here in Dearborn. See, in Dearborn, you become part of people's lives. You become part of people's lives. One day, you are just sitting in Mango's Cafe. You're with your friend. You're having nice conversation. You're talking about politics, because that's what we do. Fairuz is on in the background. And it's a wonderful Tuesday night. And then Fairuz turns off. And all of a sudden, you become part of a birthday party that you were not invited to. Whose birthday is it? Whose birthday is it? Whose birthday is it? Whose birthday? Over here, yeah, get up, get up, get up, stand up, stand up, I should stand up. Happy birthday, happy birthday, stand up, stand up. Yes, yes, everybody, come on, let's go. Louder, louder, yeah, yeah, come on. Everybody for her, yalla. One, two, three, four, happy birthday. here in Dearborn. See, that's how I know we're not white. We become part of everybody's, we're not white, man. We do things different. We're just different, okay? White people are much more logical than us. Much more logical when they buy a house, they ask logical questions. They're very logical when they buy a house. Are the taxes low? Is the neighborhood safe? Are the schools good? Not us, we're different. Yeah, I like the house, very beautiful. How far is Costco? Different standards. We bargain different. White people bargain with logic. They're very logical, all right? Dan walks into the Mercedes dealership. He's very logical when he bargains, Dan. He's very logical. We bargain with emotion. White people bargain with logic. You tell me how much you paid for the car, I'll pay a little bit more, I get a good deal, you make a little bit of money, everybody's happy. It's very logical. Not us. We bargain with emotion. Okay? We bargain with emotion. These boaters, this boater, he has the money. But he's not gonna pay what it says on the car, right? It's a matter of sharaf al balad wal aili. He's not gonna pay what it says on the car. He's not gonna pay. And he bargains with emotion. Look, I really want the Mercedes, I do, I do. But if I give you the price it says here on the car, do you know what will happen? Okay, do you see my children over here? If I give you this money, then I will not have money and they will starve and they will die. Is this what you want for me to have the car? And it works. And they all close the deal the same way. 
Every single one of them. If you give me good deal, I will tell everybody. <laughs> if you give me good deal, all of Amr Zahar comedy show at Fortson will come and buy Mercedes. <laughs> we are different. We are not white. We give directions different. White people, you're gonna go down maybe seven miles on I-94, then you're gonna take exit 172. And then at the light, you're gonna take a right, you're gonna go down half a mile, then you're gonna take a left onto Route 3. Then two stop signs. You're gonna take a right onto Maple Street, that's my street. And then you're gonna go down, you're gonna see a bunch, you're gonna see seventh house on the left, it's a white house, that's my house, 732, you can't miss it. Works every time. Not us, we're different. I remember when I was a kid, my, my uncle got a new house. I said, Amma, how do I get to your house? He said, oh, Habibi, very simple. Okay, first you're gonna go like seven or eight kilo. I'm like, what the fuck is a kilo, bro? <laughs> I grew up in America. I don't know what a kilo is. <laughs> then you're gonna see a tree, a very big tree. <laughs> okay, then you're gonna take a left. You're gonna see maybe five, six, seven stop. I don't know, I don't really stop, okay? Then you're gonna take a left and you're gonna see a black Mercedes, white BMW, that is my house. That's how we describe people. <laughs> Do you know Mo? No, I don't know which Mo you're talking about. Mo Muhammad. Okay, bro, that doesn't help. I don't know which Mo you're talking about. Mo Muhammad. Muhammad Baydun. Still doesn't help, bro. I don't know who you're talking about. Muhammad Baydun, the doctor that went to the Caribbean. No, I still don't know who your doctor. They're the Muhammad Baydoun, Fluffy, Fluffy, we call him Fluffy, you know him? No, I don't know him, Muhammad. Muhammad Baydoun, Green Range Rover? Oh yeah, Muhammad, why don't you say Muhammad? From the beginning, I know him, Green Range Rover. <laughs> we're not white. We're not white. I know we're not white because I watch the news. Now, for those of you who don't know, we Arabs, we watch the news all the time, all right? It's like a social activity for us. We call our friends over, we make popcorn, we make coffee, and we watch the news. Cause we're on it. All right, that's our TV show. That's our reality show. I don't know what white people have, Kardashians, Honey Boo Boo. We got the news. See, we have an extra special power. We can be in the news when the news has nothing to do with us. Like when some white guy does a crazy thing in America, like a mass shooting, it's always a white guy. That's a white guy crime. Mass shooting, always a white guy. And they come out two hours later and they say, we can now confirm that this is not terrorism. <laughs> you know what that means, right? You know what that means, right? You know what that means, right? That means not us. That's what it means. Because when it is us, they don't say not terrorism, all right? When it is us, they have a press conference. All of a sudden, every journalist becomes like an expert in the Arabic language. And they're, did he yell anything in Arabic? Did he say lock bar? Did he say lock bar? We, I watch the news all the time. See that? They have different words they use for the white criminals on the news, you know? When it's a mass shooting, it's a mass shooting, it's a white guy, it's always a white guy. It's never us. And they have different words they use for them. Disturbed. Deranged, delusional, all these nice D words, depressed, <laughs> for white people. It's not the word they use for us. What's the word they use for us? See how fast they said it, Dan? Terrorist. <laughs> See how programmed we are? It's not the only word they use for us. There's another word they use for us, and that word is mastermind. We're always mastermind. Something about being an Arab or a Muslim criminal makes you very smart. Master. <laughs> there was the guy in Las Vegas a few years ago. Remember him? You remember him? Yeah. Killed 60 people. He planned his crime for a week, by the way. He brought ammunition in and out of the hotel for a week. And then he waited till the perfect time. He broke the window and started shooting. He killed 60 people and he wounded 600 more people. And the next day on the news, they said he liked country music. That was a fucking headline. He liked country music. Then there was a kid in Charleston, South Carolina, Dylan Roof, went into a black church, pretended to pray with black people for an hour, and then he killed everybody. 
And then when the police caught him the next day, he told the police he wants to start a racial war between black people and white people. And Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, said, he's just a little crazy. <laughs> then there was a kid in Atlanta last year, killed eight Asian Americans in one day. The police had a press conference around him. They said, he had a bad day. That's what they said. He had, hold on. He had a bad day. Then there was one of us. Three years ago in New York City, he rented a van in his own neck. Drove down the street, ran over 10 people, jumped out of the van with a fake gun. And the police shot him and they arrested him. And CNN said, they have caught the mastermind. <laughs> this guy's not a fucking mastermind, he's an idiot. Okay, we have depressed, deranged, delusional, idiots, just like everybody else. We are not special. Okay, and then, and then you ever watch on the news whenever they catch the white guy, they always go to his neighbors and all his white neighbors always say, we're so shocked by this. This is such a surprise to us. This is my favorite one. We never thought this would happen in our community, even though their community is the only community this shit happens in, okay? It doesn't happen in other communities. They're the community. And they have a different definition of a good neighbor. He's such a good neighbor, I haven't seen him for five years. <laughs> all right, I live in Dearborn, all right? My whole street is Arab. If Im Ali doesn't see Im Hassan for like 45 minutes, she calls the cops. Hey, I think she's dead. Somebody come over. She's supposed to be smoking on the front porch right now. It's 3.30, I don't know where she is. We're all up in everybody's business. Somebody does something crazy in your neighborhood, are you surprised? No, we know. Go start interviewing people the next day. No, we are not surprised. Actually, Mustafa has been talking about doing this for like three years now. We are surprised it took this long, actually, before he did it. <laughs> we are so shocked it happened in our community. What a nice white thing to be able to say. I live in Dearborn, Michigan, okay? When a pharmacist on my street gets arrested for $1.2 million in Medicare fraud. When they talk to me on the news the next day, I do not say, I can't believe something. That's exactly the kind of shit that I think would happen in my community. Because it happens every day. And you gotta feel bad for white people. Well, not really, but. You gotta feel bad for white people because being white is not cool anymore. So it used to be cool. America used to be this place where you come here and you forget where you came from and you just become white. And as long as it was just like white invaders and black people who they enslaved and natives who they stole their land, it was easy to tell the difference. But then other people started showing up. And then, and, then I, and then like Arabs started showing up, Asians started, and then it became cool in America like 20, 30 years ago to be something. Everybody wants to be something, you know. I don't know what, what I'm 116th Cherokee, whatever the fuck they say, they want to be something. <laughs> and so they do these ancestry tests. You ever see these ancestry tests? You know what I'm talking about. You spit in it, and then you, th and then you mail it away, and they send you back like your racial pie chart, and white people love this. Just pick your race from this. Have you seen this stuff? Have you seen these commercials? It's the dumbest shit I've ever seen. Our whole life we thought we were German. And then I took my Ancestry.com test and found out that we're 21% Italian. And now we go to the Olive Garden and we eat spaghetti. Like, that's not the way it works. You don't just get to pick. There's this one commercial where there's this lady named Kim. She's white. She said, she's standing in front of all these artifacts. My name is Kim. I took my Ancestry.com test, and what surprised me the most is I found out that on 26% Native American, I had no idea. All right, now I don't have a PhD in biology or genetics, I'm not an expert, okay, but 26%, that's a lot. It's like a whole grandparent. Okay, I know where my grandmother's from. I know where my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother is from, all right? Kim had no idea. And let me tell you something, if you're white and your grandmother's Native American and they didn't tell you, that's not a good story. Okay, something really fucked up happened. This is America. I'm way 
waiting for the Ancestry.com commercial where somebody is happy to find out that they're Arab. <laughs> I don't think you're gonna see that. <laughs> Our whole life we thought we were Puerto Rican. And then I took my Ancestry.com test and what surprised me the most is I found out that I'm 26% Arab. And now we go to the airport early. You know. <laughs> I know I'm not white, because I had COVID. That's right. Even though in Dearborn, nobody had COVID. <laughs> I remember in the beginning, it was hard to explain it to all these Arabs, you know? Amo, you have to wear a mask. Okay, yeah, no, no problem. So, so when I kiss people, I just take it. No, you don't kiss people. You got to stop kissing people. Okay, so, but when I hug them, I keep them, no, you don't hug. But they will talk about me. <laughs> it's hard to explain it, you know, not greeting people with all these beautiful greetings, you know, that, that can be wrong in our culture. So COVID was hard to explain to people. But I had COVID, that's how I know I'm not white, because I had COVID and I did not lose my taste and smell. <laughs> See, we Arabs, we've been raised on a lot of spices. A lot of things. It's gonna take a lot more than COVID for us to lose our taste and smell. This is why COVID is affecting white people so significantly, you know, because, because well, look, if the first sign of danger is loss of taste and smell, then how do white people even know they have COVID, you know? <laughs> you ever watch the Food Network? That's a very white network. The Food Network, they have all these competition shows. Do you know why white chefs get kicked off the Food Network? Not enough salt. Is that a problem in your house? Problem in your house? Problem in your house? That's not a problem in our house. You ever open up a white person's spice cabinet? It's not a cabinet. It's just a little part of a cabinet. It's salt, pepper, and everything bagel spice. That's it. That's all they have. You ever open up your mom's spice cabinet? 75 clear bottles of brown powder, unlabeled. Unlabeled. And she tells you, give me the kamun. I'm like, which one? Which one is the kamun? A third from the right, fourth from the back, one in. How do you know? I can smell it from here, I can smell it. Damn. They sell white people spice mixes. You ever been to the, the supermarket aisle? They have this aisle called the international. The international aisle. It's just spice mixes, because they can't spice. A spice mix, taco spice, all this other stuff. Hamburger Helper, you ever see Hamburger Helper? That's a spice mix, Hamburger Helper. My mom would die before she ever bought Hamburger, hamburger Helper. I help the hamburger. <laughs> I don't need help. We're different, we're different. And we all live here in America now and we have to live here and we, and, and we do, we do very well. We do very well. In fact, Arab Americans have one of the highest rates of education and economic development of any minority group in America. That's right. We have more doctors than anybody else in America. Thank God for the Caribbean. It's not a bad place to get a medical degree, but it's just, you know, just a little lower standard of entry. And you know, it's like a main, it's like a built-in hookup, built-in wasta, and we take it. You're still a doctor, you know. They should name an island after us in the Caribbean. We've put millions down there. We're very educated, very educated. So a lot of us weren't born here. I want you to stand up if you are a refugee or an immigrant to this country. Stand up. Stand up. I know there's a lot of you. Stand up. Stand up if you're a refugee or an immigrant to this country. See? Look at that. That is who we are. Have a seat. One of the people who stood up is my dad with my beautiful mom over there. See, my dad was born in Palestine in 1948. 
When he was one month old, he was ethnically cleansed from his homeland. Let's use the right words, by the way. Let's not say kicked out or expelled or they left. They're kicked out because they were the wrong race or religion. We have a name for that. It's called ethnic cleansing. Okay? He was kicked out. <laughs> ethnically cleansed. When he was one month old and grew up in a refugee neighborhood in Jordan. And just so that he could go to college, he had to finish first in high school, and he did. And just so that he could go from college to a master's program, he had to finish first in college, and he did. And just so that he could go from a master's program to a PhD program, he had to finish first in his master's program, and he did. And then he came to America. And then he came to America and he worked for a big company for 35 years and he has a nice house and he has nice cars and he put all his kids through college. My dad's a chemist. He has 41 patents from the United States government. See that, that is the Arab American refugee and immigrant story. We come from nothing to everything. That is who we are. Do you know how hard it is to be the son of this person? All right, he's achieved everything. All right, I could never impress him. I remember when I was a kid, I brought home my test from school. I said, Baba, here's my test. I got a 96. Where is the other four? Oh, shit. Can't deal with these people. And they lie about us. They say we steal people's, we know not, Arabs, Arab immigrants, no immigrants who come to this country steal anybody's jobs, all right? We just, we just work a little bit harder than everybody else. We are not stealing anybody's jobs. Now, I know a lot of white people are upset when they walk into the mobile and they see Mo, that's not his name, by the way, Mo, driving a brand new Maserati. And they say to themselves, how the fuck did this guy get a Maserati? I'll tell you how the fuck he got a Maserati. Because when he came to this country, he worked in that station or some other station 12, 14, 16 hours a day to feed his family. And then he bought another station. And then he bought another station. And now he's a distributor of all the gas in Michigan. See, that's what we do. Don't be mad because we work a little bit harder than everybody. We're not stealing anybody. Immigrants, this is the biggest lie they tell on Fox News. I, don't, I have an uncle who can't say Fox News, he calls it fuck us news, but whatever. So, <laughs> which is kind of true. The biggest lie they tell about us, immigrants steal jobs, steal the jobs from real Americans. You know what that means, right? Real Americans. Immigrants do not steal jobs. Immigrants do jobs that real Americans or it might be too, too, too lazy to do, or too dumb to do, or too scared to do. See, when, when we have immigrants picking all the strawberries and produce in California, there wasn't a lot of white people doing those jobs. They didn't steal those jobs from anybody. They're just working harder. When you walk into a hospital and all the doctors are brown, all of them! I mean all of them, all right? They didn't steal those jobs from white people. They were smarter, they worked harder. See, we don't steal jobs, that's not what we do. Like opening up a liquor store in downtown Detroit. We didn't steal that job from anybody. <laughs> you tell an Arab, I have to bring a gun to work, no, can I bring two? No problem, is it? <laughs> we don't steal jobs from anybody. So that's not the way it works. But I do feel bad for our, see I came here when I was three, so sort of technically an immigrant, but, but those who came here when they were older, you know, you gotta, gotta learn English. It's a hard language. I feel bad, you know. Dan, I don't know if you know this. <laughs> Dan, what are you doing here, by the way? Did you just, <laughs> did you get the email? I don't understand. No, thank you, no, I mean, I appreciate it. We got everybody, this is the most diverse room in Dearborn tonight. Black people, white people, Latinos, Arabs, I love it. 
Dan, in Arabic, we do not have the letter P. We can't say it. We are the Palestinian B, buddy. We like to drink Pepsi and eat pizza. No pepperoni, because pepperoni has pork. This is the way we talk. Some of them been here 35, 45, 50 years, still can't do it. It's embarrassing. You gotta learn English. It's embarrassing, all right? We're trying to fit in with these white kids. You can't walk around saying salt and pepper for 35 years, all right? We're trying to fit in with these white kids. You can't walk around saying America is the best country in the world. It, world it. That's not how you say it. I know that's how it looks. That's not how you say it. You can't walk around Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. That's not how you say it. Some of them been here a long time. English is tough, man. I, I get it. I get it. Some words don't come out right, you know. Especially with the P problem, you know. Like, for instance, in Michigan, we have a lot of potholes. <laughs> Did you get it, Dan? You get it? <laughs> English is a hard language. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of prepositions in English. For, by, on, over, about. See, in Arabic, there's like three or four. And so when they come here, they got to learn all these prepositions. They just stick with one. They love four. The boaters, they love it. I'm going to take you for dinner. We're going to go for the movies. They love four. Love it. I had a friend of mine calling me a few, few weeks ago. He says, hey, you want to go for dinner? I was like, sure, what time do you want to go? He's like, I don't know, 7.30, 8 o'clock? I'm like, sure, no problem. He says, okay, I can uh, pick you. I said, okay, sure, you can pick me, it's fine. <laughs> he says, uh, when do you want me to come for you? Like 7, 7.30, you want me to come for you? I can come for you whenever you want me to come for you. I was like, no, I don't. I'm not hungry anymore. I don't want you to. It's hard, English is a hard language. Especially when they want to buy the first edition of something, you know? It's very difficult, you know? Hey, I would like to get the brand new iPhone. Oh, sure, sir, uh, no problem, uh, what do you like? I want the brand new virgin. <laughs> what do you say? I want the new, nobody touch it yet. Brand new virgin. <laughs> Go to the back, find, wrapped in plastic, brand new. I open it, brand new virgin for me. If you don't have it today, tomorrow I will come for you and I will get the virgin. <laughs> it's a hard language. I came to this country when I was three years old. Three years old, you know? Came right outside of Philadelphia. And by the time I was six, I was playing baseball. Because that's what you do in America. You play baseball. Play baseball. I was good. Play baseball. My dad would come to my games. My dad is a very supportive dad. I could not ask for a more supportive dad than my dad come to my games. And he, and he would cheer for me. The problem is, though, Arabs don't understand baseball. <laughs> Boaters don't understand baseball. Some of them have been here 35, 45 years. Do you understand baseball yet, sir? No, he does not. He has no idea. No idea. Arabs only understand one sport. What's that sport? That's right, soccer, understand. My dad says, Amr, I understand soccer very easy. Here there is a goal, here there is a goal. You kick the ball in the goal. <laughs> I understand hockey, you, you, you push that thing into the goal. I, I understand basketball, you throw the ball into the goal. But baseball, where is the goal? <laughs> So I tried to explain to him, I said, Baba, it's very simple. You stand here, then you hit the ball, then you run the first base, the second base, third base, home. When you get back home, you get a point, it's called a run, that's how baseball works. And he said, so you are already standing in the goal? <laughs> this doesn't make sense to a refugee, by the way. Why would you run everywhere and just come back where you were? This is a waste of running. So he would come to my games, 
Sometimes he'd bring his friends. You have to imagine this, okay? A bunch of Arab guys in the 1980s, big mustaches, speaking Arabic, smoking cigarettes, and saying the wrong shit. Touchdown, goal! All right? It's embarrassing. So one day on the way, I was like, Baba, that's enough, man. I'm trying to fit in with these white kids. You gotta learn baseball. And so you know what? He did what refugees and immigrants do. He figured it out. He went to the store, he bought a baseball book, he read the book, he came home, he learned all the rules about baseball, he came to my game the next week, and he cheered for me for two hours correctly. Yes! Isn't that a beautiful story? On the way home, though, I had to have a talk with him. I said, Baba, thanks for your support. I appreciate it. But it's pronounced... Pitch. <laughs> You're supposed to say nice pitch. <laughs> Beautiful pitch. Smack the pitch. That's right, my dad sounded like the Arab Jay-Z at all my baseball games. <laughs> it was not good. So we're not white. We're not white. And sometimes people say to me, okay, Ahmed, you say you're not white. So what's white? What is white? You know, that's a great question. What's white? Now, maybe it has to do with color a little bit. Okay, but some of us are kind of light and we're still not white. Okay, so color maybe something. Does it mean you're European? Maybe. Does it mean you're Christian? Maybe. I don't know. But this is what I really know it means. I know it means, in America it means, that nobody cares that you're white. Like, you cannot mess it up for other white people, all right? Like, okay, I'm an Arab comedian. If I go to a comedy club and I'm not funny, I might mess it up for the next Arab comedian. They might not hire another, and they might say, well, that one wasn't funny. So I'm not bringing another one, okay? So we can mess it up for each other. But white people can't mess it up for each other. George Bush started a fake war. Fake. They lied about it. We know they lied about it. But nobody said, hey, let's watch out for John McCain. He's white, too. <laughs> Bill Clinton. <laughs> Every day in the White House for like two years. <laughs> and nobody said, let's watch out for John Kerry or Al Gore. They're white, too. That didn't happen. Then, see? see, Barack Obama was the first black president. I voted for Barack Obama twice because he's Muslim. Anyway, so, <laughs> and Barack Hussein, I'm, come on, bro. See, Barack Obama had to be, be a perfect black guy. See, Barack Obama had to be a perfect black guy. Barack Obama, he, 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 went, he went to Harvard, he went to Columbia, he was on the Law Review Journal, he was very well-spoken, they said, articulate, they said, good-looking, got a beautiful wife, never cheated on her. See, this is, this is what you have. See, I know we're not white. Imagine this. Okay, everybody close your eyes. Let's do a little experiment. Imagine this. Imagine that when you first heard about Barack Hussein Obama in 2004 or five or six or whenever you heard about him, this black guy who wants to become president, I want you to imagine that you heard that he had five kids from three women. And he cheated on the first one with the second one. And he cheated on the third one with a porn star and paid her $130,000 to shut the fuck up. Okay, open your eyes. See, you would have never heard of Barack Obama. Barack Obama would still be in the south side of Chicago getting people out of speeding tickets and shit. You would have never heard of him. See, that is Donald Trump. See, that's how awesome it is to be white. You can do anything. You can say you want to ban a whole religious group from entering the country and you still take the oath of office. See, that's how awesome it is to be white. See, what, they can get away with anything. I know we're not white because we can, see? Barack Obama had to be the per Barack Obama is like the Mitt Romney of black people. <laughs> and Donald Trump is like the Flavor Flav of white people. <laughs> 
and he became president. <laughs> See how awesome that is? So I did this show tonight here in Dearborn for two reasons. First reason is we got to support and love each other all the time because we are having a big... Because we are having a big Arab meeting here in Dearborn with a few of our non-Arab friends. But there are a lot of other people having meetings to make sure that we never have meetings. You know what I mean? So we got to make sure that we support and love each other all the time. So the first thing I want everybody to do is look at someone next to you, especially if you don't know them, but even if you do, and tell them, thank you for coming tonight. That's right. Look at them and tell them, I'm proud of you. That's right. Look at them and tell them, I love you. That's right. Because we have to love and support each other all the time. That is the first reason I did this show here in Dearborn tonight. The second reason I did this show here in Dearborn and tried to fill up a room full of 600, 700 beautiful Arabs is because nothing makes me happier than being in a room full of my people. Nothing. And especially now, because now I'm 44 and I am still single. That's right. <laughs> Should I get married? Should I get married? Should I get married? Okay, raise your hand and you're here and you've been married for 30 years and you're here with your spouse. Okay, hands down. Hands down. 40? Okay, hands down. 50? There's not a 50. What? 50 years, sir? Wow. And you guys, you guys are white? I can kind of tell through the lights, yeah? Thanks for coming to the show. See? Beautiful. Any Arabs here raise their hand for 50? <laughs> 50 years? 51 years. I shot a lot. Wow. What is your first name, sir? Samir, and what's your name, ma'am? Alfreda. Are you one of us? <laughs> Alfreda? What'd you say? Lebanese, Lebanese, okay, Lebanese, so okay. Samir and Alfida. See, let me tell you something I know about them. How long have you been married? 51 years? 50, let me, let, let me tell you what scares. Anybody newly married? Just like newly married, just got married? Yeah, how long have you guys been married? Oh, seven months? Oh, so you still like each other or whatever. <laughs> let me tell you something I know about Samir and Alfreda. I don't know them but I know how they talk about each other. See, I see people have been married for a long time, you ask them how they talk about each other, and it's never good for the man. <laughs> if you ask Samir and Alfreda how they met, Samir, he says, what men say. The first time I saw Alfreda, she was the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life ever forever. And I knew I wanted to be with her forever. And you say to Alfreda, Alfreda, tell us about the first time you met Samir. And Alfreda says, what women say. When? The first time I met Samir, I never thought I would end up with somebody like that. <laughs> But, but he grew on me like a disease. He grew on me. Ooh, hey, yeah, nah. All right, it's like, it's the best you can hope for. It's the best you can hope for, bro. It's the best you can hope for seven months. <laughs> Scares the hell out. How'd you guys meet? Are you cousins? <laughs> hey, some, Dan, sometimes we marry our cousins, all right? There's nothing wrong with that. It just means you know they come from a good family. All right, nothing wrong with that. 
Look, you think that's weird? Go down to Alabama and start asking them about their love stories. One day I just saw my sister and I knew that she was like, shut up, bro, that's disgusting. All we do is marry our cousins. It's hard now because I'm 44 and I'm single and my, my mom is asking me weird questions now. My mom called me a few years ago. You know how you're when mom calls you and you know it's not gonna be a good conversation? Okay. She called me, she said, hi, Amir. I said, hi, mama. She said. <laughs> and she said, Amir, I am your mother. It's okay. She said, you can tell me anything. I said, okay. She said, no matter what it is, I will love you. I will not judge you for who you are. I said, okay. She said, are you gay? It's okay. Just tell me. Now she's not mad that I'm gay. I mean, I'm not gay. There's nothing wrong with being gay. We have gay Arabs. I'm just not. You know, I like women. But she, she now believes that I am. She's gone through whatever the five stages of grief are. She's gone through all of them already. Okay, anger, depression, bargaining. I don't know. What they, she got to, like, acceptance. She got there. She's at acceptance. Now she's not mad that I'm gay. She's mad that I'm gay and not telling her. Why don't you just tell me? Why don't you tell me? She tries to trick me into confessing to this crime, which I have not committed. She calls me and says, Amir, are you dating any girls? I said, no. She said, others. I said, no, no others. Now, whenever I go visit their house, she can ever watch Law and Order when they, they have the guy in the interrogation room and they already know that he did it. And they're just trying to get him to confess. That's what she does now, you know. She just walks into the kitchen. Amr, listen, we know, we all know. We already know, we have you on video, we have your DNA, we have fingerprints. We know you did it. She does this Arab mom move. You will feel better when you tell me. You will feel better. It's hard, man. But I love it. There's nothing I'd rather be than us. Because I'm not ashamed to say it. We have the most beautiful culture in the world. We have the most beautiful culture in the world. See? Our names have meaning. Names have meaning, have history. See? Where we come from has history. See, we come from a beautiful place in the world. Have history. You know? I always tell people I'm Palestinian like Jesus. Because he was one of us, right? Yes. He was one of us. He was one of us. We got to explain this to white people, all right? He was one of us. We should probably use him a lot more. He's very famous. He's one of us. He didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes, all right? He didn't look like Brad Pitt. He looked like DJ Khaled, minus 100 pounds, basically, is what Jesus looked like. He looked like every dude in this room, is what Jesus looked like. Jesus could not get on a plane if he lived in America now. See, America is a young country. It's a young country. They don't understand in America, a very young country. In America, somebody says they walk into this beautiful high school. And they say this high school is 100 years old. It's very young. And then you go back to where we're from. You go to Jerusalem. And you're eating a falafel sandwich. And you say to the owner of the restaurant, tell me about this restaurant. And he says, well, Jesus ate there. <laughs> And you're like, all right, that's old. <laughs> See, we have a beautiful culture. Like our names have beautiful meanings. See, girls' names especially. For some reason, girls' names, you know, white names don't really matter. I'm like, you know, any white ladies here? Like, well, what's, what, uh, uh, 50 years married. What's your name, ma'am? Carol. See, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I have no idea. I know what every Arab girl's name means, though, because they tell us, and I love it, okay? We have, for some reason though, like half of Arab girls' names either have to do with deer 
or something to do with the moon for no reason whatsoever. You know? Like you can have three Arab girls talking to their dad, Baba, what does my name mean? Oh, Habibti, your name means dear. Your sister name, baby dear. Your other sister name, you know when the deer is walking and it looks in the sky like that? That is your other sister's name. Or like something to do with the moon for no reason whatsoever. Baba, what does my name mean? Oh, your name, Habibti. Wow, wow, very beautiful name, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, all right. You know when the moon touched the sky at 7 p.m. and the red line goes like that? That is your Beautiful. This is why when Arab guys come to America, they're able to get white women so easily. Because they do this poetic stuff on them. We have any Arab guys married to a white lady here? Yeah? Where is she? Yeah? What's your name, sir? Ahmed, what's your name, ma'am? Kelly. See, I don't know what the fuck that means either. <laughs> Kelly. Ahmed and Kelly. How long have you been married? 21 years? That's beautiful. Beautiful. Let me tell you something I know about Ahmed and Kelly. When they got married, Ahmed did not become more white. Kelly became more Arab. Because that's what we do. Our culture is contagious. <laughs> you become more like us. Kelly was living a nice, regular, white life. <laughs> it was boring. She was putting everything bagel spice on everything. And then she runs into this immigrant. And he swept her off her feet. And now her life changed a lot. His life didn't change that. Her life changed a lot. She started learning how to cook Arabic food. You're dancing in circles now. You're kissing people you never met before. You have 75 cousins. That's the way it works. You become one of us. So that's what happens with our culture. That's why Arab guys are able to get white women. So they do this poetic shit. On them. And it works. I've tried it on Arab girls. It doesn't work. They don't fall for it. But I've seen them, I've seen the shortest, fattest, baldest boater. He walks up to the hottest girl in the club, he doesn't give a shit. He walks right up to her, hey, you, 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 come here, come here. <laughs> you are the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in my life, ever, forever. Okay, you, 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 you are like the sun. And the other gear are just the stars. Okay, when you walk, it is like a deer walking in the forest. Your eyes are like the eyes of a cow, which in our culture is very beautiful. What's your name? Kelly? Wow, Kelly. Beautiful name. Do you know what your name means? You know when the moon touched the sky at 7 p.m. and the red line comes like that? And they get American citizenship? And they can stay. <laughs> See, that's why we're here tonight. We're here tonight to be proud of our culture. I want everyone here to be proud of their culture. A lot of you out there, I know it's hard to be one of us. But a lot of you out there, you try to fit in with white people too much. You know? Give your kids white names. I don't like it. This is my daughter, Samantha. <laughs> Okay, her name is Samantha Tofiq Abdul Rahim. It's not gonna help, okay? I think it's gonna help her. Stop it! Stop it! Don't give your kids white names. Give them weird names. When you have a weird name, you know your culture. That's the way it works. Give them weird names. And you guys stop changing your names, especially you guys. Stop changing your names for white people. I hate it, okay? Muhammad becomes Mo. Jamil becomes Jimmy. Hassan becomes Sam, Sam becomes Sam, Samir becomes Sam, Samir becomes Sam. There's a lot of Sam, too many fucking Sams. Stop it. Don't change your name for white people. Be proud of who you are. Don't change your name for anybody. All right? Listen, we have to learn their names. They have to learn our names. Those are the rules, all right? Their names aren't easy. Tyler, Taylor, Mason, Madison, Brittany, Whitney, Carol, Kelly. We have to learn all that shit. 
They have to learn our names. We have to learn their names. They have to learn our names. Those are the rules. Don't change your name for anybody. All right? If your name is Muhammad, be Muhammad. If your name is Jamil, be Jamil. If your name is Fatima, be Fatima. If your name is Jihad, be Jay, because we have enough problems. We do not need any more problems. I love you, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks for coming out. I love you so much. Have a good night.